parents need to understand that while we certainly hope that our schools, our teachers, our principals, guidance counselors are all wonderful people who only want the best for their students, we have to live in reality and recognize that while some of them do have an agenda and that may not be healthy for our children. Dr. Miriam Grossman, child and adolescent psychiatrist, also one of the stars of our film, What is a Woman? She now has a new book out, excellent, important book, called Lost in Trans Nation, A Child Psychiatrist's Guide Out of Madness. Dr. Grossman, thanks for taking the time. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for all you do, Matt, in this space. I was just this morning enjoying some of the you know, some of your posts on on X and some of the other things you've done, and I really appreciate it. You're one of the leaders. Well, um, I appreciate that, and I appreciate you as well. And, you know, you have a, a real uh, important, insightful perspective on all the gender madness. I, I'm curious about one thing. What, um, what did you think was kind of, or what do you think is missing from the conversation around this issue, or what point... Uh, is not being emphasized enough or well enough understood that prompted you to, for example, to, to write the book? Well, you know, I want to start with some good news. Because <laughs> um, I'm always presenting very disturbing information, and I will certainly answer your question, but I want to tell you, Matt, you may not be aware that our favorite pediatrician, Dr. Michelle Forcier, is being sued. And if there's any of your audience who are not aware who she is. She is the infamous blue-haired pediatrician who posed that question to you. Do chickens commit suicide in your documentary, What is a Woman? Dr. Forcier is being sued, finally, by one of her patients who detransitioned. And apparently this young woman was extremely mentally ill and had all sorts of psychiatric issues. And I have to say, the lawyers are jumping on these cases, and I'm so happy to see it after all these years. Yeah, the, that's the, 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 the chicken lady, as we have uh, come to call her, is, you're, you're exactly right. And do you, do you think that this is the beginning of kind of the floodgates opening? We, we've all been sort of waiting for this, that uh, this was always the next step in the fight for team sanity was that we start holding these doctors accountable. So do you, do you think that there's evidence that this is like the beginning of, uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg? Yes, absolutely. And it's not only the individual doctors that are being sued. The American Academy of Pediatrics is also named uh, as a defendant. So this is fantastic because the American Academy of Pediatrics that claims that they represent 67,000 pediatricians has been for many, many years completely captured by this ideology. And the way that it happened is that a small group of activists from within that organization simply took over this particular subject and started um, you know, writing policy statements and articles and guidance for other doctors and for parents. And none of it is uh, is evidence-based. They claim that it's evidence-based. It is not. It is a belief system that we are not, that our identities are completely separate from our bodies, that we can be born in the wrong body and that that is not an emotional problem, that's a physical problem, and you need to modify the body to fit the feelings. These are irrational ideas. These would not fly in any other field of medicine. So yes, this is very big. I think the tide is definitely turning. There's been a lot of successful legislation, and now these lawsuits are beginning like I said, not only against the pediatricians and the therapists and the endocrinologists and the surgeons, but also against the medical organizations. So this is good, very good. It's definitely very good. Well, and I know you're not a lawyer, of course, but do, do you, uh, and I, I always err on the side of being somewhat cynical about these things. So my worry is that obviously uh, 
the the victims that are filing these lawsuits should win easily and they should win mi- many millions of dollars but you worry about the courts just being ideologically stacked against them so do, do you feel good about the chances of like this particular lawsuit of of having success g- given that problem you know you you're correct to bring up you know who's going to who's the judge who are the attorneys uh you know if there's a jury who's on the jury but then my experience testifying in court has been very positive, actually. And when you get a judge who is, you know, middle of the road, open, wants to learn, someone who wants to learn and to hear both sides, then definitely, you know, there can be a success at the end of it. But you're right. It does. It is going to depend a lot on the judges. But I'm st- I'm still hopeful because it's certainly better than nothing. And, you know, we'll get the media coverage and we'll get more and more um, young people who went through affirming care will have the courage and the motivation to stand up and talk. I'm curious about your uh, general assessment of, I guess we've already kind of got into this, but your general assessment of of the battle as it stands right now, um, are you? Now we talked about the lo- the lawsuits, the success with legislation, uh, s- but culturally speaking, do you do, do you do you feel like um, we're making a lot of progress there? I actually do. I, I feel like you know, as, even aside from legislation, and now we've got what's going on with litigation, which is really important. But it seems to me that culturally is where we can really see the victory even more because it, it, it seems as though people are willing to speak out against this uh, much more than they were back when we first started filming the, the movie back in 2021, for example. So do, do, you, even, do you sense even that as well? More than a year. Yeah, even, I, I, I do agree with you. The thing is, look, this is a battle that the truth is going to win. The question is how many, you know, what's what's the body count going to be? And the body count from where I'm sitting is very high because it's not just the kids who end up, you know, medicalized and forever um, disfigured. And some of them are going to be sterile and, and not capable of having biological children. But you see the families, the families are also victims, the parents and the siblings and the extended family, because you know, this battle that that is created inside the home when a child announces a, um, a, a new identity, an impossible identity, it, it can tear a family apart. It can end marriages. Um, sometimes the child is so indoctrinated that they believe anyone that is hesitant or has questions or wants to be cautious is the enemy and that their homes are toxic. They run away. There are websites, I talk about this in my book, there are websites run by activists who are advising kids on how to run away, where to run to. They provide them with uh, financial help. They tell them, you know, call this number or uh, text this number and we'll come pick you up and take you to a friendly home, a home where they will affirm you. So there's a lot of terrible things going on, a lot of families in which these kids become estranged, uh, terrible pain and mourning that parents go through. So yes, there is progress, but at the same time, there's a lot of victims and there's a body count. Absolutely. You mentioned, uh, you talked about families and, and uh, kids that get that, that fall into this through no fault of the parents. So I wanted to ask you about that on a kind of a, on a more personal and practical level, because I hear from parents all the time who either have kids who fall fallen victim to this or they're worried that their kids will potentially fall victim to it. You, of course, have talked to many more parents than me on this issue. So I want to take both of those cases individually. So first of all, um, would you say some basic steps a parent can take proactively, uh, especially if their kids are in public school or something, and 
They want to make sure they want to inoculate their kids as best they can against yes. falling into this. That's my my book is an inoculation. I want parents to start really early. I mean, as soon as your kid is talking and kind of understands boy, girl, you know, I, that identity, um, it's not too early to say things like, you know, you've been a boy since the very first moment that you existed when you first started growing in your mother's tummy or however you want to say it inside your mommy, your, your mother, you were a boy that it doesn't depend on some random midwife or doctor who's in the delivery room. I want kids when they first hear that phrase sex assigned at birth, I want kids, even little kids to, to stop and say, no, no, that's not right. Sex is not assigned at birth. It might be recognized at birth, although now we recognize it way earlier. It's established and it's established permanently at conception. So you can begin early on with kids and you can say to them things like, you know, you were always a boy or a girl and that's great. And there isn't only one way to be a boy or a girl. There are many infinite ways of being boys, girls, men, and women. And anyone that might come along and say, oh, you're a girl and you don't, you're not into fashion, makeup, you know, you're into playing soccer and, you know, you're, I mean, all these regressive stereotypes, right? That's a bunch of baloney. These stereotypes are a bunch of baloney and we have to tell our kids that you can be a girl or a boy in many different ways. There's no just one way. I also tell parents it's important that they themselves accept that their daughter may not be stereotypically feminine and their son may not be stereotypically masculine. It may not be the kid that you expected. Accept it, try very hard to accept that your kid, and not only, I mean, you have six kids, you know all about raising kids. They don't always end up the way that we were expecting. But certainly when it comes to masculinity and femininity, you wanna accept who they are and what their interests are and not necessarily you know, push them in the direction that you think, well, boys you know, have to be X, Y, and Z. So you can do all of that. You also, of course, want to inoculate your child against so many of the ideas that are out there, not just the ideas about gender. I mean, that may, that's the topic of my book, but there's so many ideas that activists are just waiting outside your door or inside the computer, inside the chat rooms, and Parents must get in control of their of their kids' internet use. One of the appendices in my book, I have seven appendices. One of them is written by an IT expert, and it instructs parents on all the different ways you need to get in control of your of your kids' internet use. If you're not in control of it and your kid is just wandering around on the internet, trust me, there are plenty of groomers out there that are just eagerly waiting to influence your child. And I've had one family after the next come to me and their child has been groomed into these beliefs of being the opposite sex on the internet. So that's one of the appendices. Um, another thing a family can do early on is put the school on notice. And I have a entire chapter about schools. Parents need to understand that while we certainly hope that our schools, our teachers, our principals, guidance counselors are all wonderful people who only want the best for their students, we have to live in reality and recognize that while some of them do have an agenda and some of them do want to influence our kids and influence them in ways that we wouldn't necessarily agree with. So you wanna put the school on notice and the way that you do that is you download a form. I actually have it on my website. My website is miriamgrossmanmd.com. 
when you land on the website, you see a form putting schools on notice. You download it, you print it out, it's free. Uh, You sign it and you give it to the principal of your school. Your child may be in kindergarten. It's never too early. That form is saying to the school, our family does not go along, does not agree with gender ideology. We do not give permission for our child to be exposed to any of those ideas, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's in a special assembly or meeting or a field trip to Planned Parenthood or um, a guest who's gonna come and speak to the class, an after school club, uh, like a GSA club, one of those, we are prohibiting that, we do not give our permission and we hold you responsible for any damage that may result. We definitely do not give our permission, this form says, for our child to be what's called socially transitioned, which means um, to use a different name for the child, to allow the child to use the opposite sex bathrooms, et cetera. This is socially transitioning is not a benign process. It has consequences. And as far as we know, we don't have much research, but as far as we know, it solidifies the identity. So whereas many of these kids, after a while, they grow out of the unhappiness, the dysphoria that they have with their physical sex, if you, if you and it makes sense, Matt, right? It, it's just common sense. If you agree with the child that their name is wrong and that their pronouns are wrong and that they need to live their lives as the opposite sex and use the opposite sex bathrooms, et cetera, and everyone in their lives, all the adults, all the authorities are agreeing, then of course it's gonna solidify the child's belief. And so I caution very strongly against any kind of social transition. Profiling, surveillance, and data harvesting are a few things not to like about tech giants, but what can you actually do about it when you rely on so many of their products? Well, the good news is it doesn't take much for you to take a stand. For less than $7 per month, you can join me and fight back against big tech by using ExpressVPN. Big tech companies make all their money by tracking your searches, video history, and everything you click on, and then selling your personal data. ExpressVPN helps you anonymize much of your online presence by hiding your IP address and unique identifier that every device has that allows big tech to match your activity back to you. That's why I use ExpressVPN on all of my devices to make it much more difficult for them to exploit my data. Best part is how easy it is to use the ExpressVPN app. I just tap one button on my phone or computer and I turn it on and it's that simple. Your data is your business. Visit expressvpn.com slash WalshYT. Use my link at expressvpn.com slash WalshYT to get three extra months free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S, vpn.com slash WalshYT. Um, I want, we only have a couple of minutes left, but I, 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 there's something obviously related to this that I've uh, been wanting to ask you. And I, I don't even know if this is exactly true or not, but the way, you know, and it's, but it's an interesting pattern that I, that I think I've noticed which is um, at the kind of different age ranges, which sex between male and female is more susceptible to this. So we, we all kind of understand that among adolescent kids, girls are falling into this much more often than boys are. It seems to me that, uh, that younger than that, though, young kids, five, six, seven, most of the time when you hear about a young kid that age, who's being, as you say, socially transitioned, usually it's a boy. And then you go into adulthood and you look at the people who as adults start suddenly identifying as trans. It seems like almost always, with rare exception, it's a man. So um, I don't know, have you noticed that? What do you, what do you make of that? What do you make of like, the, does the age range and the sex of the person uh, yes. make them more or less susceptible? It's a very important distinction and I go through all of this in my book, we've always known about the little kids, the Jazz Jennings, the bo- the little boys, who from an early age insist that they either are or have to become a girl. And we've always known about the middle-aged men like Admiral Dr. Levine, who in their 
40s or or later decide that you know these are these are men who are heterosexual they have enjoyed cross-dressing um, and going into women's spaces they are sexually aroused by that and we've always known about them they um, also sometimes will decide to go through sex so-called sex reassignment but now there's an entirely new population um, of kids who who are suddenly out of the blue without a history from childhood of wanting of being uncomfortable with their sex and these are a majority although there's still a lot of boys I mean my practice has essentially been 50 percent boys and girls but yes Matt you're bringing up something very very important what we're looking at now and everyone you see it's being denied by the proponents of this. But those of us who are on the side of hard science and hard evidence, those of us that are seeing these kids in our office know that it is a social contagion and it is fueled by the internet, by social media, by friend, friend groups. What is a social contagion? It's when ideas and behaviors and beliefs are spread within a friend group. And it can be something benign like a haircut or you know a way of dressing, or it can be something that can be dangerous. And look, I've had kids tell me, I had a young woman in my office who told me that she never had any dysphoria, any unhappiness about her hips until one of her friends who's transgender identified started complaining about her hips. I hate my hips. They're so wide. They're so feminine. Why can't I have narrow hips like a boy? All of a sudden, my patient starts having dysphoria about her hips. It is a social, con and this is also why, Matt, a lot of kids who go into a psychiatric uh, inpatient unit, they enter that unit not being trans. They leave the unit a few weeks later, identifying as the opposite sex or non-binary or some other such nonsense term. Because while in the hospital, in that psychiatric unit, so many of the kids, probably more than 50, 60% of kids now who are in inpatient psychiatric units for adolescents do have some sort of gender issue. And so this is a big, I write a chapter in the book about the dilemma that a parent is in when they must place their child in one of these units because they are suicidal or they have some other acute emotional problem, but they don't want to do it because not only are most of the kids suffering from gender dysphoria on, on that unit and it, and it will spread, but the staff on the unit, more often than not, they are proponents. They are often activists. They have been told by their professional organizations and by their hospital administration that the first thing you do when you meet a kid is you ask their name and pronouns and you give them your name and pronouns. I had a psychiatric nurse write to me and she said, Dr. Grossman, I work with these kids on an inpatient psychiatric unit and I just can't, I can't believe what we're doing. We start off asking them their pronouns. They're just arriving. They made a suicide attempt. They're being bandaged. Their wrists are being bandaged. And we're supposed to begin with, what are your pronouns? What name should I be calling you? And she ended up, she quit. She just quit. We have a big, big problem. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I, I guess I'm not surprised to hear that, but on another level, it is shocking that they would uh, start with that level of indoctrination when a kid is, is that, you could not possibly be more vulnerable. Um, obviously, there's a lot more to talk about. I wish we had uh, more time to talk about it, but the good news is that uh, your book, Lost in Translation, Child Psychiatrist's Guide Out of Madness, um, can be uh, purchased right now by anyone in, um, where all these ideas are fleshed out uh, in even greater yeah. detail. 
Um, I want to mention also that I did the audio version. I, I actually narrated the entire book, took 40 hours. It was quite an experience. So um, people are loving that. So for people who don't want to sit down and read and they're commuting or they're busy in the house or they're jogging, whatever, you can listen to it on audio. Yeah. Every family needs the information in my book. Please, I'm begging you. And, I, and the fact that you have narrated your own audiobook, I actually, as, a, as an audiobook snob myself, uh, I always prefer for the author to read their own work. So I'm glad that you did that. Um, and uh, that's also a, a great way to, to uh, access this information as well. Dr. Grossman, uh, thanks so much for talking to us again. Really appreciate it. You're welcome, Matt. Thanks for having me. 